So welcome, everyone. It's fantastic to see so many friendly faces, folks from the department, but especially folks from beyond the department, um, friends and family, close associates, uh, not just of the department, but of John Quinn, the person that we're here to, uh, to honor today. So I have a few remarks that I'll try to get through quickly because our guest, our speaker, Bill, um, is one not to be missed. Uh, so this event is held to honor the legacy and memory of John Quinn, an incredible scholar and human being who left an indelible mark on the field of chemical engineering on this department, chemical and biomolecular engineering, and on the people whose lives intersected his. His was a distinguished career that spanned five decades. Uh, John uh, received his bachelor's in chemical engineering in 1954 from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And as many of you know, there's a, a trifecta between Urbana, Carnegie Mellon, and Penn uh, in the context of John Quinn, um, and his PhD from Princeton in 1958. He returned to Urbana that same year to join the faculty and uh, pr was promoted to associate professor in 64 and then full professor just two years later in uh, 66. In 1971, the world changed for Penn and he moved to uh, the University of Pennsylvania where he remained for the balance of his career. In 1978, he was named the first recipient of the Bent Endowed Professorship. He chaired the department uh, from 1980 to 1985, and during that time, he oversaw the early beginnings of what would be called a substantial shift in the field of chemical engineering uh, to embrace uh, emerging areas of, bi of biology and, and biotechnology. John was among the first of his peers to recognize the potential for applying the quantitative insights and methods of chemical engineering to the development and exploitation of a molecular level understanding of biological components, systems, and processes. Uh, John conducted, conducted pioneering research on mass transfer and interfacial phenomena. I think he's best known uh, uh, for contributions in this area, elucidating the role of the interface in the transfer between phases. Uh, this was fundamental work that had immediate relevance to industrial separations processes, and that combination of fundamental work that could be immediately applied to industrial uh, matters, I think, is something that uh, is the hallmark of his career. His work was often the first to examine or um, or to provide critically needed re-examination of various physical situations of interest, including colloidal particles, molecular or macromolecular solutes diffusing through porous media in the presence or absence of charge. Okay. Some of John's work was focused, for example, on detailed examination of hydrodynamics that determine the hindrance factors for solute diffusion through pores. This is a topic that many of us uh, study still uh, to this day. In later years, his work focused on problems related to bioengineering and biotechnology, to transport through synthetic membranes, and to the application of membranes in chemical processes and in systems of medical and biological relevance. This work led eventually to the co-founding of the company Sepracore by Stephen Matson, one of John's students. John served as a founding member of the Scientific Advisory Board. Stephen, unfortunately, cannot join us uh, here today, but sends his regards. In recognition of his research contributions, John received the Colburn Award of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers in 1966 and the Institute's Alpha Chi Sigma Award in 1978. Uh, the list of his awards is too numerous to mention. Um, I will uh, note a few. He was elected to membership in the National Academy of Engineering in 1978, and his citation reads, for pioneering research in mass transfer, particularly phenomena associated with transport through interfaces and membranes and he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1992. While I never had the pleasure of knowing John personally, his legacy and impact are visible in his proverbial footprints. His fundamental contributions to elucidating mass transport across thin interfaces and solute diffusion in porous media, to name a few, the vibrant and intellectually rigorous department that I had the honor of joining in 2018 that he left behind, and of course, his students. He supervised something like 40 doctoral theses and we're very honored to have some of his former students with us here today, including uh, family and friends. This annual lectureship was started in 2004 by John's students, and with the exception of 2020 and 2021, it has been held every year and features a distinguished speaker from the chemical engineering community. We're privileged to be joined by many of John's family members, past students and friends here today, and this year's speaker, Bill Hammock from the University of Illinois, continues that proud tradition of the Quinn Distinguished Lectures. So a little bit about Bill, and then I will yield the floor. Bill Hammock is a William H. and Janet G. Lycan Professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He received his Bachelor's in Chemical Engineering in 84 at Michigan Technological University and his PhD in Chemical Engineering at UIUC in 1988. He joined the faculty at Carnegie Mellon, that's the uh, third leg of the stool, in 1988 as an assistant professor before leaving in 97 to join his alma mater, Urbana-Champaign. 
Bill's early work focused on high pressure physics and physical chemistry, examining pressure induced changes in physical and electronic structure of inorganic materials. But in more recent years, he has pioneered multidisciplinary engineering education, public outreach, and service to the profession through development and communication of internet-delivered content that is remarkable in its effectiveness, and I will experience that today. His outreach work has been recognized by the National Association of Science Writers Science in Society Award, the American Chemical Society's Grady Stack Medal, and the American Institute of Physics uh, Science Writing Award. His books include Michael Faraday's The Chemical History of a Candle with Lectures, Teaching Guides, and Student Activities, and several others that I uh, probably should not list. He has won a long list, and I do mean a very long list of awards, and again, in the interest of time, I will just uh, cite a couple. Uh, he was elected in 2022 to the National Academy of Engineering, and his citation reads, for innovations in multidisciplinary engineering education, outreach, and service to the profession through development and communication of internet-delivered content. I'm going to hit pause there because really I will take up much more of his time if I go through the whole list. Bill, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Very good. Well, what a pleasure and honor to give the uh, Quinn Lecture. And it's a pleasure that's only increased because of our mutual Illinois connection where, as you heard, both graduates uh, of Illinois and both have served as professors there in 1958 to 71 for John and me in 1998 to, to, the, to the present. And I would love to share with you that I have his old office, but I don't. <laughs> uh, I, I spent a lot of time figuring out where it was. Uh, <laughs> and it was a couple floors away, but I do wander in the hallways uh, that John walked in for over 15 years, if you had his time as a professor and time as a student there, it's the same building. Now, part of the richness of John's legacy, and I'll mention just a little more uh, toward the end, uh, is the ingenious experimental methods he pioneered to measure mass transfer rates. And now, I'll, I'll mention that again because it's relevant toward the end, but it's that kind of engineering creativity that I'm gonna highlight today. And it's a creativity that I think for far too long we've, we've hidden uh, from the public. And we, in doing that, we keep from view all that's exciting uh, and enticing about doing engineering. And by not really clearly sharing that with the public, by not sharing what the engineering method is, we dissuade the best and the brightest from uh, seeing engineering as a very creative endeavor, which of course in turn uh, robs us of the generation that is going to solve the problems we have. So this afternoon, I'll share with you over about 45 minutes, four examples of that creativity that span 800 years uh, to show in all its glory uh, the engineering method. And these illustrations today will range from construction techniques of antiquity uh, to delays today's uh, molecular biology. And I'm a little nervous about the molecular biology part being here at Penn, but <laughs> bear with me as we get there. Uh, these are all examples of design, which is the defining activity of an engineer. We want to keep that in mind. And in doing that, we're going to see the core of the engineering method. We're going to see how it differs from science uh, and why it thrives on uncertainty. And I'm going to start with what the public often confuses for the engineering method. In their minds, engineering is a subset of the scientific method. Uh, the public thinks of it to use a, a fairly horrid term as applied science. And I'll return to that again toward the end. Um, and that difference is really reflected in an old joke, almost a bitter joke amongst engineers. If it's, success, if it's a success, then it's a scientific miracle. And if it's a disaster, then it's an engineering failure, right? And this conflation of science and engineering is so pervasive that that differentiation is going to appear as a theme throughout the talk. Now, to suggest that engineering practice isn't subservient to the scientific method probably strikes a counterintuitive note here in the room. After all, as engineers, we are steeped in science. Surely you cannot function as an engineer without science. So let's start with this question. Do you need science to engineer something? And to answer that, I'm going to show you something designed and constructed by a team of engineers who never learned science, or even the basic arithmetic taught today in third grade. 
So this is the interior of Saint-Chapelle. I apologize to all French speakers in the audience. The interior of Saint-Chapelle is built in the mid-13th century and is what an incredible design if you have been there and visited. It's in Paris. Its ceilings, its arches, its pillars, they're constructed from 400 tons of stone, but it isn't dark and somber like the Romans' uh, buildings from late antiquity. And it was by design that the interior fills with light. It's a hallmark of Gothic, Gothic architecture. And unlike the Romans, these designers used pointed arches, which we see here, to create stained glass windows that diffuse the sunlight into this red, blue, and gold that we, that we see. Because the Romans were interested in an earthly empire and the medieval uh, builders in a spiritual empire, if you will. Now, to make my point, I could have shown you any of the many chapels and cathedrals from the Middle Ages. I think there's 500 in France alone. It's very hard to establish exactly how many. But they all were designed, and they were constructed like Saint-Chapelle by, again, a team of engineers without scientific or mathematical knowledge. Yet, these medieval engineers understood stone structures so well that only a small fraction of cathedrals collapsed in their lifetime of service, and then only after centuries of neglect from the Reformation. Most often, the things that fell were actually towers of the cathedrals, and a tower is a different thing. So, the reason that I start with this is the design of Saint Chapelle and other cathedrals or chapels uh, strips away all that I think is confused for the engineering method. It, it, it strips away scientific inquiry, mathematical manipulation, computer algorithms, you know, atomic level structural knowledge uh, of, the, of the materials. And it exposes what lies at the heart of the method, which is a surprisingly simple but rich notion called a rule of thumb. And to illustrate that, let's look at how a medieval engineer, more properly I should call him a mason, they had many different roles, only one of which was an engineer, but it was embedded in the mason's work. How do they design the walls for safety um, so they could create these breathtaking arches? And the key was the correct thickness of the wall supporting the arch. Uh, if it were too thin, obviously it would buckle. Uh, if it were too thick, then you would reduce all the open space and not have the beautiful uh, stained glass windows or room for them. Um, and also, it would cost a great deal uh, to make. I mean, you want to economize the amount of stone that you have. And to size the wall, to size the thickness of this wall, they used a rule inherited from late antiquity and one used in the Pantheon and one used in Hagia Sophia. A stable arch results when the thickness of that supporting wall is about a fifth to a fourth, somewhere between there, the span of the, uh, of the arch. Now, remember that the mason had never learned to read, let alone calculate a ratio, nor did they have a ruler. There was no standard yardstick they used. They may have had a rod that was a standard length for that, but not marked with numbers. And so let me show you what they did in order to size these arches. Oops, it's the wrong button. There we go. So they changed that calculation into an action. And this is the rule of thumb in action. And I've shown all the steps here. First, the mason ran a rope along the arch template as if draping it over uh, the template itself, shown here. Uh, his main task, by the way, was to cut wood templates that were the shape of the blocks, so that when all the blocks went together, they made a cathedral. In fact, the masons had incredible, uh, the head mason had incredible 3D visualization because they did not use blueprints, they did not make drawings, it was all in their head and he would go in and cut these, um, uh, these wood templates. Um, so he then cut the rope to equal the length of the arch as it curved from uh, this section of the wall all the way over to here. Uh, he then fooled it into thirds and marked each with colored chalk. And note there, instead of measuring it, dividing by three, they folded the rope up, so that's an action. And with that rope marked in three sections of equal length, they returned it to its original place, draped along the arch template. And then using the chalk marks on the rope, he marked two key spots on the arch itself, uh, right here. Um, and then he pinned that rope uh, to the point that I've labeled A here, drew it taut to the base, 
and then double the size of the rope. Now, the length of that straightened portion of rope and its particular angle is really key here. Um, as you can see, here we go, that ends up being the thickness of the wall, all right? And that, expand, that extension is really the hypotenuse of a right triangle. It's unlikely that the mason had ever heard of either of these, hypotenuse or triangle. Um, and the shortest leg, of course, would become uh, the, the uh, final measurement. Um, this, role, this rule uh, ensured centuries of stability, uh, all without the simplest uh, mathematical calculation. Where did this proportional rule come from? Well, it, it was derived from thousands of years of application and refinement. Um, as more structures uh, stood with using this rule, uh, the rule continued to be passed on orally and used repeatedly. And it was many, many of that they used in order to, uh, to design a cathedral. Uh, they drew on their intuition. Uh, they would uh, assess the quality of stone and modify this rule a little bit. They would put uh, plaster or mortar inside uh, after they had set up the arch and watch where it uh, cracked. But the basis was this, uh, this rule called the proportional rule. Now, this is a rule of thumb. More formally, we would call it a heuristic. Uh, it's an imprecise method used as a shortcut to find the solution to a problem. And it's an idea that is so old and so pervasive that practically every language seems to have its own corresponding term. And uncannily, they all follow the theme of body parts. In French, it's the nose. In German, the fist. In Japanese, measuring with the eye. And in Russian, by the fingers. And all of them express this method of guidance by common knowledge, a kind of protocol of estimation. In practice, it is anything that can plausibly aid the solution of a problem, but it's not justified from a scientific or a philosophical perspective because it doesn't need to be, um, simply because it can't be justified or just because it works. Now, rather than define a rule of thumb, I'm going to go over the four characteristics of a rule of thumb. And to do that, I'm going to use an example that is uh, currently on my mind. It is chess. Every Thursday at 3 p.m., I attend chess club. It's a chess club composed of first, second, and third graders. My older son is a second grader. I'm pleased to report to you that I can destroy any first grader in chess. <laughs> and in fact, it's something of a moral dilemma whether you should do that or just hold off. Uh, but I should add to you that I struggle at the third grade level. So that tells you the chess that I know. So when we want to teach these kids chess beyond the mere mechanics, which they get down very quickly, we share with the students a simple axiom, axiom rather, a rule of thumb to improve their boards, and that is control the center of the board. Now, this will illustrate the four characteristics of a rule of thumb. First, a rule of thumb reduces the time and effort needed to search for a solution to a problem. You know, a player could plan for many specific game scenarios as possible, but by generally positioning her pieces, uh, you know, at the center of the board, most of these scenarios are covered without fretting the details. Second, it um, can secure a probability of success, but doesn't guarantee success at all. A player who controls the center of the board will, uh, you know, not necessarily win every game, but a chess hobbyist who makes a point of doing this is likely to beat their opponents who ignore the rule. Uh, second, it can remain valid while simultaneously con uh, contradicting other rules. This is a characteristic of rules of thumb. You know, you can win also by establish outposts for your knights or keep your bishops on diagonals, um, which might require you to give up control of the center of the board, but these rules can coexist. And fourth, and really importantly, is it rejects absolute standards. Rules of thumb are designed to be applied and judged according to a problem's context, uh, but they become useless, uh, perhaps even meaningless, when they are applied abstractly or objective, uh, you know, objectively. Um, you know, a chess theorist might not be able to find solid you know, grounds on which to say control the center of the board is better than, I don't know, save your king's moves for the end. Or maybe a better example is uh, we have these rules of thumb, we teach them, if you play speed chess, 
these rules may lo no longer be useful uh, because the context has changed. So now let's think about the mason sizing that wall. First, the proportional rule could uh, size a stable wall in a matter of minutes without spending the time needed to learn mathematical knowledge or uh, to uh, learn the, about the materials, um, which anyways they lacked access to. They wouldn't have been able to, to understand that. Second, although you know any grand structure could collapse, it reduced the risk of collapse considerably. Um, they knew that other masons had used this proportional rule, and so they knew that their walls were likely to, uh, to be stable. Uh, third, sizing a wall using the rule alone might create too weak a wall. So as I said, they used some other rules of thumb at the same time. Uh, we can find rules of thumb uh, passed down where they talked about how to assess the quality uh, of stone, and you would make your wall a little bit thicker uh, or a little bit thinner, depending on that. And finally, these are all relative. Uh, they're robust when building cathedrals, but they would fail catastrophically uh, when applied beyond the construction of medieval stone architecture. Uh, these proportional rules worked in Gothic buildings uh, because they never exposed their um, materials to, to anywhere near the, fail, the uh, failure point. Um, Stone, if you have a column of stone, it won't begin to crush another, the stones at the bottom until it reaches uh, 6,500 feet. I think I put meters up there, 1981, uh, if you would prefer meters. And to give you an idea, the tallest cathedral is, uh, is the spire of Salisbury Cathedral, which is 404 feet. So over here, uh, this is to scale, there's 6,500 feet, and there is the, the um, Salisbury Cathedral. But you know, if today an engineer brought back the Mason's proportional rule uh, when designing a skyscraper, which is a post and, and lintel system, uh, you know, it would be uh, rubble under its own, own, own weight, likely before it was even completed. And I think this is a picture of building the um, uh, Empire State Building. Now, the fact that rules of thumb are relative, that they can coexist, uh, that they can be tossed out contrasts, uh, difference between the scientific method and the engineering method. Uh, the value of a rule of thumb isn't established by conflict, like in a scientific theory. I mean, you think maybe of Einstein's theories being replaced by uh, uh, replacing Newton's theories. Uh, you know, in a sense, um, Newton's theory was proved wrong and revered in history, but you know, abandoned in some ways by theoretical physicists. Although I will note that I'm told that when engineers put satellites uh, in the sky, they still use Newtonian mechanics. Uh, so there's a, a, a kind of rule of thumb, if you will. Um, but the medieval Mason's proportional rule was never proved wrong. I mean, the cathedrals are still around today, you know, is proof in its, in its favor, right? So it was the material world, it was the development of iron and steel that left the rule behind. So in their time and their place, the Mason's rules of thumb were indispensable, insurmountable, but once no longer useful, the Gothic rules, instead of evolving, just disappeared. And as I said, historians had to, uh, architectural historians had to reconstruct those. Um, and only, you know, that's really only been done in the last 50 years. Now, I know it's tempting to think of the methods of these medieval builders as antiquated that they're mere placeholders until the real answers arrived in our scientific age. And we might then look at the Mason's rules of thumbs as, as, as uh, in their design methods as proto-engineering. It's a, some primitive method that evolved into sophisticated ones that we use today. But as we'll see, that's incorrect. Because the purpose of the engineering method is to solve problems before we have scientific certainty. So put another way, the scientific and engineering methods have different goals. The scientific method seeks to reveal truths about the universe, while the engineering method looks for solutions to real world problems. The scientific method has a, a prescribed process, uh, a little bit character here, but we all learn it in school. State a question, observe, state a hypothesis, test, analyze, and interpret, but it doesn't know what will be discovered. Um, in contrast, the engineering method has a specific goal, an airplane a computer, a cathedral, but it has no prescribed process. And that engineering method 
cannot be reduced to a set of fixed steps that must be followed precisely because its power lies in the fact that there's no must. And the specialized skill of an engineer, the defining trait, the great creativity, and what we must show the public is finding that correct strategy to reach a goal, a goal and to select among and combine the many rules of thumb that will lead to a solution. Yet, we teach engineers a lot of science. I'm an engineering professor, right? And that brings me to the true relationship between science and engineering, a relationship illustrated by this device, which I'm guessing is familiar and perhaps even dull to most of the people in this room. Uh, these are the blades and the axle of a steam-powered turbine. It's a ubiquitous device. It generates the vast majority of, uh, of our electricity. And it works like this. High-pressure steam flows into the turbine. As the steam expands, it spins the blades attached to a shaft. And as that shaft turns, uh, it turns, spins magnets that then generate electricity. Yet despite its familiarity. Few of us know how the interplay of science and engineering produced the first turbine. Now, a turbine was a dream for thousands of years. And to see the engineering problem in creating one, let's look at the two earliest devices that use steam expansion to directly rotate a shaft. So we're talking about before reciprocating engines, which used a set of levers. This is to rotate a shaft directly. And one of the earliest was this device, called an eolipile. And I apologize to all Greek speakers uh, in the room at this point. Um, it was designed by Hero of Alexandria in about 130 BC. The ball here is filled with water. Uh, you heat it, uh, steam blasts through the nozzles, and it spins the device. And this device, well, delightful. I have actually one on my desk. It doesn't have a much, enough power to do anything. To generate enough torque to drive something, uh, you would have to increase the pressure inside here dramatically, and then the um, steam would exit uh, at some 1,200 miles per hour. Just to give you an idea, that's many times what the winds are in a hurricane. And at such a speed, uh, the device tears itself apart. Then here's an additional problem that we have had with it. Um, here's what happens often. Let me find the mouse here, because I think I have to click on this. All right, this is from my studio. There we go. Uh, so it must be precisely built and balanced. It's actually very tricky. Uh, in a forthcoming video series, I'll mention this at the end, uh, every time this happens, uh, the device is destroyed because it's bent. And we needed this in the video series that's coming up, so we ended up buying four of these uh, ultimately, sequentially, until we could finally get the shot that we wanted. I'm expecting the business office to contact me at any time. And so I actually, I use so much strange stuff in my videos that I keep it all because I'm afraid they're going to come back and ask me to think that I have been taking this home for my kids or something. So it's all in boxes that are labeled back to 15 years and I can get it out. So I have all of these bent ones. So that's the first problem, the speed of rotation uh, to do something useful is very hard to manage, both mechanically, um, if you will, and just from the speed of rotation. And here's the second method to use steam. Oops, I didn't know it was going to Okay, here's the second method used uh, to uh, directly rotate a shaft. And this is a fanciful wood cottage from the 17th century. Uh, I think it's 1629, and it's an engineer named uh, Giovanni Branca, his Italian engineer, and he proposed a, a large boiler shaped like a head, a human head, and what blasted out of its mouth was a jet of steam that struck a paddle wheel, so it's a little bit like a water wheel, and which turned gearing that drove two pestles that pounded mortars. And when engineers built these kind of devices, not only did the paddle wheel spin so fast that it blew apart, like Hero's device that I showed you, the high velocity of the expelled steam uh, cut through the metal of the paddle wheel. And so for centuries then, these ways of using steam to directly rotate a shaft could not be made to work. In fact, in the early 19th century in Great Britain, uh, well into its industrial revolution, there were hundreds of inventors who patented steam turbines, all of which failed, until 1885, when Charles Parsons cracked the mystery 
of how to, 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 to uh, tame steam to directly rotate a shaft. And to succeed, he brought to the problem an astonishing knowledge of steam and steam engines, which he acquired as a child. This photo shows the front yard of his childhood home. Right? Now, unbelievably, this was at the time, and this is about 1865, the world's largest telescope, uh, known locally as the Leviathan. And to uh, show you the scale, notice that there are three figures at the bottom here. There we go. Uh, Parsons himself is on, is on the right. His father was one of the most important astronomers of the era. But for our story, though, it's Parsons' uh, childhood milieu of machinery and manufacturing that's important here. Uh, near the telescope, um, there was a foundry. Its yellow flames lit the ground all night. Uh, the place smelled of, of, uh, of, of, of um, smelting iron. Uh, there were workshops filled with lathe, cranes, glass blowing tools, and there was a team of five live-in blacksmiths at his house. And small wonder that when he recalled his childhood, and I want to quote him here, he recalled it as making contrivances with string, pins, wires, wood, sealing wax, and rubber bands as motive force, making little cars, toy boats, and a submarine. But none were more attracted to him than steam power. Uh, under his father's guidance, uh, he and his brother built a steam carriage that traveled seven miles an hour. Um, it's a stunning device when you consider it's an, an age where the horse was still supreme and would be supreme for several more decades. And he never lost his fascinations with steam. Uh, later in life as a father, um, he was always thinking of novel ways to use steam power. And this photo here shows his son with a steam-powered helicopter. Uh, Again, this is the 19th century. And for his children, he designed a small car with three wheels and a motor powered by burning rubbing alcohol that chased his children and the family dog around the yard. His wife banned him from running such toys uh, after they caught the house on fire. And uh, she also forbade him to transport the kids in a steam-powered stroller of his design uh, <laughs> because she, he used a cookie tin as a boiler. And she worried, rightfully so, that it would explode. So using his phenomenal machining skills, his deep understanding of steam, uh, Parsons created an arrangement of 30 wheels, which I've shown at the top here. And this is a schematic. We saw an actual one a minute ago. And this avoided the high speeds that plug devices like Hero or Bronca's devices. And recall that in those devices, the high pressure steam uh, inside was allowed to expand all at once to the atmosphere uh, at hurricane speeds, which destroyed them. And so, what he did was he let the steam expand bit by bit. And in that way, he controlled the speed. So it was slow enough that it would not destroy the device. And um, to give you an idea, if he had used one blade and released it, it would uh, spin at maybe 50 or 60,000 revolutions per minute. But in his first turbine, which he designed, he was able to reduce that to about 18,000 revolutions per minute. And if you are a designer of, of turbines here, you, you know that that's uh, still quite fast. It's about twice what today's turbines work. But it was slow enough that it would work. Now, this design is simple in concept. But Parsons himself described the practical problems of ex-unit's design as of almost infinite complexity. And think of what he needed to know. He needed to know the number of steps to use so that the steam would expand slowly enough that he could control the rotational speed. Um, this device wouldn't work if this wheel and this wheel or any of the wheels rotated at different speeds because it would twist it apart. And that meant that he needed to adjust the spacing between the blades or make them longer. Uh, because as it traveled, because it, as it traveled down the, the, the turbine. In fact, you can see that here if we look at the, the real one, um, in the, this modern one, rather, you'll note that, it, that as spent steam exits, the spacing between the blades is greater and the blades themselves are longer. And uh, lastly, he needed to be sure that at each uh, wheel, the speeds of velocity was low enough to avoid cutting steel. Now, what separated Parsons from the hundreds, perhaps thousands of inventors before him was how he navigated his way through what he called infinite complexity. 
Uh, Parsons was among the first engineers to be university trained, uh, similar in a way to how we train engineers today. And so he turned to what he called the data of the physicists. And in that data, we're going to see the relationship between science and engineering. Essential to Parsons was the information contained in these three volumes. And this looks like clip art, but these are actually three volumes from our University of Illinois Library, and I actually took that picture. In these three volumes is a lifetime of work by the now forgotten French scientist Henri Victor Renault, and I apologize to all French speakers in the room now. Uh, it was so famous in his time that Gustave Eiffel chose him as one of 72 uh, French scientists memorialized on the Eiffel Tower. Listen to some of these names, Clapron, Fourier, Cauchy, Fresnel, Poisson, Le Chatelier, Laplace, Ampre, Navier. So he's in that class. And what the patient and careful Renault spent nearly 30 years documenting as reported in these 3,000 pages is the thermodynamic properties of steam and other substances. All chemical engineers in this room will recognize that these are the first steam tables. And from that data tabulated here, Parsons could determine the, the uh, volume of steam at every stage of his turbine. And that's how he knew how, mu he knew how much to increase the blade spacing. Uh, as it traveled uh, throughout the device. Now, one thing I like about this is Renault's work helps dispel one myth about engineering and science, and that's that a dramatic uh, scientific breakthrough must precede a revolutionary technology. And I don't mean to devalue uh, his work, but even by the standards of time, it was, uh, well, dull, all right? In his obituary, a prominent chemist eulogized him by saying, as a scientific investigator, Rinyo did not possess the brilliant originality of many of his fellow scientists. A historian of a scientist described Rinyo's work as preoccupation with a tedious accumulation of experimental results, adding that Rinyo dislikes speculating and discussing theory. And that's hardly the excitement we associate with a scientific breakthrough. Now, the state alone was not enough. Uh, Parsons needed one more thing to know how to calculate the velocity of the steam through his turbine. Recall that the velocity must be low enough uh, so it would not cut the metal blades and then it would spin the blades at the correct speed. So he needed to know how fast steam would travel between the blades. So his second scientific resource was the theoretical work of William Rankine. Rankine was a Scottish scientist. He was a founder of thermodynamics. In contrast to Winyo, he was a anything but diligent, quiet, careful, and conscientious. He was a born performer. He liked to sing at the British Association. The British Association is the most important scientific meeting, or it was at the time, in the United Kingdom. And he was as likely to do that as to deliver a paper. So 10 years or so after Winyo began his work, scientific papers just gushed from Rankin's desk. And these laid the foundation of thermodynamics, although they're often built on a uh, idiosyncratic and now forgotten molecular uh, hypothesis of molecular vortices. But of importance to, steam, to Parsons' steam engine was an 1870 paper on a phenomenon much similar than these complex theories, and it was just simply how to calculate the velocity of steam from a nozzle, a small opening, using Rigno's data. And the passage between the blades of the turbine was, of course, a small opening like what Rankine calculated. And so now we see the two things that we need, uh, engineers need from science. They need high quality data, and they need some theory on how to calculate with that data. From the combined work of Rigno and Rankine, Parsons knew, and I quote him here, that a successful turbine ought to be capable of construction because he could now size the number of wheels needed, 30 in his first successful turbine, and he could adjust the blades so that the steam flowed at the same rate through every section. But not exactly size them because it still took 10 years, uh, but it was a starting point that would converge to a successful, time, uh, successful device for the first time. So Parsons' engineering would be impossible without the help of science, which makes his work, I think, a paradigm for understanding the relationship between science and engineering. The astronomical number of dimensions and configurations of blades in every other design variable in the turbine were vast, 
but the scientific knowledge helped rule out what wouldn't work, narrow the possibilities for what does, and shorten the path to a solution. That's a classic rule for rules of thumb. And that is the relationship between science and engineering. Scientific practice and knowledge offers engineers gold-plated, grade-A, supremo rules of thumb that work better than those observed merely from long uh, periods of trial and error or from observation. Rules, though, that do exactly what the proportional rule did for the medieval uh, mason. So, to say science created the turbine would be to overlook Parsons' Greek creativity, uh, his superior machining, his 10 years of trial and error uh, that he needed to refine it, and to call Parsons' work applied uh, science is then we can see now fuzzy thinking. I mean, it's like saying uh, that carpentry is applied hammering. Uh, composing music is applied pitch, or uh, writing a book is applied lettering. So, whenever we reduce any engineering achievement to one single cause, to the discovery of a scientific fact, or even the development of the first working prototype, we hide the very rich creativity of engineers from the public. For example, we're all very familiar with the story of Edison and the light bulb. It is the canonical invention story. Uh, it's told that once he discovered the proper filament, largely forgotten, but it was carbonized bamboo, bamboo from Japan. If you go to Japan in one of the, I can't remember the name of the city, but there's still a memorial to Edison because it's where the bamboo came from, then the story kind of ends. And I know that we all love stories of soul inventors whose spark of you know, inspiration revolutionized the world. Uh, they give us narratives that are needy, that are tight, that are digestible, uh, but they're incomplete. And in telling those narratives, it hides the engineering method, and it controls, it, it conceals, rather, the creative engineers. It uh, smooths over struggles, it sanitizes choices that reflect uh, cultural norms. A technology like a light bulb uh, only solves problems when it can be manufactured and mass-produced. So a handful of working light bulbs in the late 1880s, no, no doubt it's a marvel, uh, but it doesn't light the world. So in a sense, the invention of the incandescent light bulb is a decades-long process of incremental change to create a filament that can be manufactured reliably. And to tell only a great man story, um, you know, short changes, I think, the contributions, uh, inventive and imaginative engineers who are essential to the development, for example, uh, it hides the creativity of Lewis Latimer. You've probably never heard of him. Uh, he devised novel methods to reliably manufacture and assemble these carbon elements, or filaments rather, and his work was the industry standard uh, for the first decade of the commercial light bulb, a critical period that uh, cemented the light bulb as essential. Until the carbon filament was replaced by the ductile tungsten light bulb, uh, invented by William Coolidge, which is another untold story that we could uh, talk about. Now, these inventors of the light bulbs filament, Parsons Turbine and the grand structures of medieval builders leads us to the best definition of the engineering method, which I've purposely put off rather than start with that. Solving problems using rules of thumb that cause the best change in a poorly understood situation using available resources. And that last phrase, poorly understood situation, uh, surprises because, you know, surely you're thinking that the stunning advances in scientific knowledge, uh, understanding and techniques, you know, in our century and the previous century will remove the need for rules of thumb uh, and uh, under, uh, remove the uh, uncertainty. Um, yet, as I pointed out, nothing of that happens because as scientific knowledge advances, Engineers step beyond that knowledge because the purpose of the engineering method is to solve problems with large degrees of uncertainty. That's the central reason that the engineering method exists. Humankind developed it uh, to reach beyond codified scientific knowledge. So instead, the advance only pushes out the boundary uh, between the certain and uncertain, and so rest, resets the boundary where engineers work. Now, this molecule, illustrates the idea. It's an enzyme in, in nature. It enables a, a chemical reaction to happen. Uh, I'm going to return to that, but I'm going to pause for a moment just to reflect how appropriate it is that I'm going to end the Quinn lecture. We have about eight minutes or so uh, left here. 
um, with the story of a chemical engineer in biology, because part of John's legacy, and we heard a little bit at the beginning, is the linking of chemical engineering in the biological sciences. Uh, I mentioned at the outset his clever and his insightful experiments on membranes, and that led him to transport across membranes in physiological or biological contexts. And, you know, well, today, the importance of chemical engineering is taken for granted in, you know, modern biotechnology, biomedicine, drug discovery. That was far from apparent when John embarked on an academic career in 1958. And yet he became convinced that modern biology constituted a new frontier for chemical engineering. And he acted on this conviction, dramatically expanding the scope of opportunities for chemical engineers in practice and theory, and helping to redefine the chemical engineering curriculum to include concepts of biology and physiology. So now, let's return to the experimental method and enzymes. This is biology now. <laughs> our bodies are filled with thousands of enzymes and you know they do everything. They help our cells grow, they reproduce, move, communicate with other cells. And this particular enzyme called subtilisin, subtilisin breaks down organic matter. And here is a video. This is from my studio also. Um, on the left, it's covered in only water. On the right, this enzyme subtilisin is, dissol is dissolved in water. And this is time lapse taken over nearly 30 hours. Uh, note that the gelatin in the water remains intact, but that in the enzyme, it dissolves. And I will say that we didn't realize how much the building jiggled until we did a 30 hour um, time lapse. And so there's quite a bit of correction to this that you can't see. Uh, so subsilicin breaks the chemical bonds holding the gelatin together. And that ability to break bonds is of the utmost importance to engineers. You know, breaking and reforming bonds, um, that's what creates the engineering world around us. In manufacturing chemicals and pharmaceuticals and plastics. So it's no surprise that an engineer, here, Francis Arnold, a name no doubt familiar to many in this room, decided to use these natural enzymes in industrial processes. But now there's a problem. Enzymes uh, like subtilisin work only in water, and they work under a narrow range of temperatures. Uh, think of the enzymes in your body. You know, once your body temperature deviates by more than a few degrees from normal, um, everything stops working, right? Yet, in the industrial use envisioned by Arnold, she needed it to work at all temperatures and in harsh environments. And so, of course, when Arnold put it in an organic solvent, I think it was dimethylformamide, think of paint stripper, and you have a good idea of what the chemical is like. I'm dealing in popularization here, so I'm gonna say paint stripper from now on. The enzyme no longer digested, pro uh, uh, no, no longer digested proteins. It, it lost all of its activity. Now, to engineer this enzyme, Arnold drew on a stunning advance, a detailed molecular understanding of enzymes. In April of 1953, three papers appeared back to back in the journal Nature. Uh, these papers led to the deciphering of the code of life embedded in DNA, and they opened a deep and rich mind of knowledge about how organisms work. And of course, you see Watson and Crick here. Wilkins shared the Nobel Prize, and down here is Rosalind Franklin, who did some of the X-ray work maybe all of the x-ray work. Uh, but key for this afternoon is, is it reveals that we can look at this enzyme um, in a different way. We could instead envision it as a sequence of amino acids. And the, amino, the enzyme is one long chain all curled up, and so this list, this sequence, shows the amino acids from the beginning of a molecule to its uh, end. And when we look at it like this, we can see the task that faced uh, Engineer Arnold. This sequence of amino acids works well in water, but which would she need to change to modify subtilisin so it worked in paint thinner? Would it be a single amino acid? If so, which one? Or maybe two of them needed to be changed? Maybe it was three that needed changed. No, she couldn't know because it was impossible at the time to calculate from first principles the activity of a particular sequence of amino acids. 
So we're right back to that uncertainty that I've been talking about. And the choices she faced were astronomical. There's 275 amino acids that make up the enzyme. There are 20 different types. So the number of possibilities is 20 raised to the 275th power. You know, it's, I'm told, far greater than the number of stars in the universe, and that is something like 200 uh, trillion, right? So to engineer subtilizing to work in harsh environments, she used nature's own mechanism. I'm going to show you what she did. If you are a directed evolution person, you will know this but this is something that captures the, the essentials of what she did, which I think it just well, it doesn't need me to say it. I think it's absolute genius. So she randomly mutated naturally occurring subtilisin, and I've showed it in the middle here. And she used a method that replaces, oh, I don't know, one, two, three amino acids here or there. And I've illustrated that here with 10 mutations, and I've used different colors to illustrate that. She didn't place these in tin dishes filled with diluted paint thinner, as I've called the solvent. And she dissolved the mutated enzymes. She added a block of gelatin, we'll say, uh, and then washed the dishes for a day or two. And most of the mutated ones showed no ability to digest the protein, but at least one managed to partially dissolve it. And she selected that enzyme the one that worked, created from it 10 more mutated versions, filled the dishes with stronger solution of paint thinner, and then tested it again. And she repeated this until nature engineered for her an enzyme that worked in a harsh chemical environment almost as well as the original did in water. And by this directed evolution, she harnessed that nimble, that adaptive quality of, of evolution. And she directed along paths that nature had left unexplored. And in that way, she overcame scientific uncertainty. And Arnold noted when she accepted the Nobel Prize for Chemistry that, and I'm quoting here, and this is, uh, I forget when she won, 2016 or 18, even today, we struggle to explain how her evolved enzymes work. Adding that a wonderful feature of engineering by evolution is that solutions come first, and understanding that the solutions may or may not come later. I will tell you her engineering approach met resistance from scientists and she's reported this and those who wanted to understand proteins were aghast and they cried, that's not science. Um, and she responded by explaining, I'm an engineer, noting her goal was the engineer's guiding principle of quote, getting results quickly. And that's a classic statement of the purpose of the engineering method as I've been noting. You know, perhaps the day will arrive, perhaps it has arrived, you will tell me. Uh, when, you know, ab initio, we can design enzymes. But the point here is that for a decade or two, uh, we have used these molecules, you know, created by her directed evolution to diagnose and treat disease, to reduce farm waste, to improve textiles, to synthesize industrial chemicals and pharmaceuticals, and to remove stain. Um, stains, they're a key ingredient of laundry detergents. In fact, that's where we got our sub to license uh, from. To lack information, yet design something useful signals that an engineer is at work. We don't wait until a scientist uh, thoroughly understands a phenomenon because the public can't wait for science. So in the absence of complete information, engineers for centuries have created buildings, devices, and systems that revolutionized the world, a, a world full of steel towers, lithium-powered cell phones, ocean-crossing airplanes, life-saving medicine, and spacecraft that journey outside our solar system. All of them created by the most powerful uh, method available to engineers, which is, uh, to the public rather, to humans, which is the engineering method. And that brings me to my important and final point. The ways in which engineers work their way around that uncertainty must be placed front and center to the public because that highlights their creativity, their ingenuity, their cleverness. These are the hallmarks, of course, of John Quinn's work, which will inspire the next generation of engineers. And if you'd like to engage with these ideas that are presented, you can watch a forthcoming four-part video series. You can't actually watch it because it's forthcoming. But I, when, I, when I return uh, to uh, Urbana, I hope to finish this. I'm afraid my children um, gave me uh, illness that made me hoarse for about a month, which has slowed everything down. 
And it's a series, it's a companion to my book, The Things We Make, which just came out uh, a month ago. So thank you for listening. So is Lulu in the room? He may not be. That's fine if he isn't. I had him explain uh, I mean, I, what is machine learning. And I made him take me through from the very beginning of that. And it's something I've been looking to. It strikes me as exactly the engineering method and exactly the way that engineers operate because it's essentially about enormously sophisticated correlations. And so to my way of thinking, not real knowledgeable, but there, it is exactly the same thing. It's, it's, you know, the, the engineering method on steroids, if you will, right, right? It seems in showing the work from Francis Arnold that there is a place, though, where those heuristics or rules of thumb come from, that is failed experiments. You didn't show the cathedrals that fell in. Well, there aren't very many. Well, who knows what happened then? Well, but there are, they're, they're just... They, they were the, no, no, there are not, we'll move to find the remains. There are very, very few, very, very few. I mean, that's a good point. And again, most of what fell were towers. Uh, so uh, um, a failed experience would certainly fit into that camp of the observation uh, to find the rule of thumb, I would think, right? If that's what you're asking, okay, yes. Yes. Which is very interesting because with Florence, apparently decided they wanted a dome of a certain size. Nobody knew how to build it. But they were willing to wait about, what, maybe 100 years for somebody to come along and figure it out. Yes. Uh, well, I've been in that dome. Have you been in that? And there's a wonderful book by Ross King. Uh, that is very much worth reading. He's a novelist that does the science and engineering correctly. He wrote a nonfiction book on it. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know, remember all the details, but he did end up building a fake inside, if I remember right, that gives you the shape and then built the outside of it, right? So he couldn't quite solve all the, all, all the problems to have the aesthetics that he wanted. Um, but I, I don't remember the details well enough of that. Well, you know, that is a huge and controversial topic, but my uh, view is that we spent way too long with the trust me, trust me, science is important, trust me, trust me, here's your capstone engineering course. And instead, we needed to move that to the front uh, and have that, some of that engineering be done and as much as possible justify in time the things we need, which is how all of us operate. When I have to fix my plumbing or my garbage disposal, I certainly don't spend a year on the mechanics of it. You know, I get in there and look, what's wrong? Let me read a little more about it and do it iteratively. Uh, and so I know at Illinois, we have introduced a design across the curriculum project and that the students are doing a design project in their freshman year, another one in their sophomore, another one in their junior, another in their senior year. But Woodrow Wilson, who was president of Princeton, said it is harder to move a graveyard than change a curriculum. Uh, 
<laughs> so maybe that's where the problem is. Right. Yeah, you use the uh, word uh, creativity and creation and problem solving throughout. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I, I recall saying, what a ridiculous device. Why would I want one? Yeah, exactly. I am addicted to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Came from yeah. Creativity. And the word engineering derives from the Latin word for ingenuity. Okay. And the only reason we have an E in front of it, the English language, because that's the way we pronounce it. But every other language uh, in Europe uses I for engineering. So I think if we just. Uh, Well, and I think part of the problem with talking about the creativity is you have to, which I did a bit today, is you have to look at case studies and get into the details because that's where that shows up. And I think, that, you know, having just written a book on this and tried to figure out how to tell stories to do that, it's essentially a set of anecdotes that illustrate the overall theme and you have to be willing to get into some of those details and see what they did with blades and turbines or whatever it is. And one way to emphasize that for undergraduates Move design to the freshman year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that is, of course, harder to teach. Uh, and I, I'm a faculty member, too. And open-ended projects are harder, and you know what I mean? And, I and more time. Oh, yeah, I'll bet you. <laughs> I'll bet you do. I'll bet you do. Yeah, very nice talk. Thank you. Do you Thanks. agree that a safety factor of, for example, 1.2? Engineering uh, method. You say it again, Winston. I, I, I'm, I said, do you agree yeah. that using a safety factor, or for example, one point, sure, 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 yeah, you know, and the engineering method. That's a classic rule of thumb to have a safety factor built in, right? Yeah, yeah. I would say it's a rule of thumb. I mean, my my favorite among those is the hundred year wind they use to design buildings which if you look into it, it's a statistical method that uh, to you know, estimate what the maximum wind is most likely to be in 100 years, they use it for skyscrapers. And if you take a deep look in it, uh, you find out that it's extrapolation, which is what I tell, we tell our students never to do, but it is a cardinal thing in civil engineering to design it. And if you take a deeper look into what philosophers and scientists and mathematicians, they say, they say this is not really <laughs> justified or reasonable. Uh, to do, and I quote that in the book a, a little bit. Yet it is an engineering rule of thumb because it's something that works that has allowed us to build skyscrapers. So it appears to be incredibly sophisticated mathematics, and it is in a way. Yet at its base, it is not really different than the proportional rule, and that's another safety factor. I'll take the prerogative to ask the uh, last question. Okay. We're just about out of time. Very good. So you mentioned towards the end of your talk um, navigating uncertainty. Yep. That engineers in their work uh, must often navigate uncertainty and that this is a key part of uh, their ability to solve problems. We live in a society in which you know, the truth is uh, oftentimes uh, uh, you know, more and more obscure from the viewer uh, and in which critical thinking um, seems to play less and less of a role in everyday life. Can you give us your thoughts on how uh, navigating uncertainty or uh, being skeptical uh, as, as, you know, as one's intrinsic nature can actually help you even if you're not an engineer? I, I'm, I'm, uh, I thought you were asking a different question, which I answered in my head, uh, and then I got the wrong uh, question. Because I, I tell you where I thought you were going, uh, is that uh, once we have, once the public knows it's uncertainty, are we gonna open ourselves up for a lot of lawsuits uh, that we're after, which is a question I get quite a bit. Uh, so you're, you're, you're saying how to use this in, in, in everyday life? That's right, how to use the techniques or the intuition Well, I think well, I think we all do, and that you you 
uh, you parameterize, you add in safety factors. Um, I left for the airport at 4.45 uh, in order not to be late, uh, right? So I added a, 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 a factor in there in case uh, the limo were late or something else had happened. Um, so I, I, I think it's just in, the, in that uh, uh, being empirical about things would be my guess. All right? Great. So we can continue the discussion at the reception. All right. Thank you.